Okay, we apply a blue hearing. We'll have uh, Mr. Van Dyke to present his side, Kevin present his side, and the council will make a decision. Mr. Van Dyke, you're up. Well, thanks, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Scott, Aaron, uh, and I'm assuming when you say Ted will present his side that, that we're starting with his August 8th letter because without that we don't have anything to respond to. So uh, it, it all starts with the city declaring what you believe to be nuisances and then us responding rather than us having to disprove something that's very vague. So I'm, I'm kind of going by this letter of August 8th uh, and just responding to that. I think probably we can take all 30 of these and, and put them into some fairly narrow categories which might help the discussion. Uh, one category that folks have seemed to single out that you've mentioned several times are volunteer trees. Uh, for example, in items two and three, and then just several places throughout here, 13, except for he says removing the volunteer trees. Uh, nowhere in the ordinances of the city of Lakeview are volunteer trees declared a nuisance. And Aaron or Scott or anybody, if you disagree with me, I'd, I'd like to see it because I have gotten copies off the internet and we do have a chapter about nuisance trees. There are several kinds that are singled out in chapter 151, um, like cottonwoods and things that are deliberately planted. And there's a duty to trim trees that are overhanging streets and sidewalks. But I don't believe that anywhere in the laws of the city of Lakeview are volunteer trees declared a nuisance. This, this citation did, as far as being in 50.02.10, and it refers to brush. 50.02.10, weeds and brush. Yep. Dense growth of weeds, vines, brush, or other vegetation. So you're, you're claiming that that's the one, Scott, is the sub-10 there, 50.02, sub-10. Okay, dense growth of weeds, mines, brush, or other vegetation. Yeah, I think, Jim, uh, there's two parts to uh, photo number two. Um, it's not just, uh, uh, you know, scraps of uh, or weeds or uh, brush. It is also the... Uh, language in the citation is tire and scrap. Uh, right, I understand. I was just now focusing on the volunteer trees plan. Okay. And I understand Scott's position section 50.02 sub 10. Okay. The second category would be everything inside versus outside the fence. And I think almost everything in the 30 items that she uh, mentions are, yeah, there are a few that, that are a little bit different, but almost every one of them is moving inside the fence. And um, that is an issue that we visited a little bit back when it was a lot colder. Uh, just as a refresher, I brought copies to the council of a memo that I presented back in January, February, anyway. Um, about the, uh, the issue of whether or not the, I bet, I okay, uh, the salvage yard is the, the right term is grandfather. Uh, Aaron and I speaking that goofy language of lawyers and call it pre-existing non-conforming use. Um, but most people are just considered to be grandfathered and I also have a photo that Pauline found that's dated April 58 showing that uh, the folks were already salvaging trucks back then and it actually started before that. Um, Albert and Pauline acquired this property like in the, like in 41, anyway in the 40s, from mm -hmm. Helmick, not from Helmick, from the Bright Box. Family. Family. So they owned the property back then, but they really didn't start operating it until the 50s as a salvage yard. 
And it's our position, and I, and I have this in both the January 30 memo and the March 19 letter to Scott about pre-existing non-conforming uses. Um, I, I just want to note on tonight's record that these folks were operating a salvage yard probably 30 years before the ordinance was passed about the fence. And I mentioned this back in January, but I think we're getting it down to a real important narrow issue now. And Aaron and I have had some conversations about this issue. That is, if you're in business, my position that the cases support this. If you're in a legitimate legal business, which is licensed by the state, and the Raritans have had sales tax permit for quite some time, they're zoned properly, they're in the industrial zone of the city, so they're a lawful business, and then you pass an ordinance after the fact, you can't make people comply to something that wasn't in effect for all those first 30 years. They did build a fence. They do have things outside the fence. We don't dispute there are some things outside the fence. But one of our legal positions, and I believe supported by our Supreme Court cases, is that when you make laws after the fact, you can't go back and enforce it against people that are in a continuous business. Um, and I don't think there's any dispute that they're in a continuous business with that photograph showing that they're already working on truck chassis uh, 50 years ago right now. Uh, I think anybody who's been in Lakeview, how long have you been in Lakeview? The whole life? 77 years. 77 years. Anybody that's been in Lakeview will know that they've been in continuous business long before that fence ordinance was passed. So that's our second position. And the third position, and, and Jim, before you go on to number uh, three, if I could, um, after our last uh, um, hearing, and I, I wrote to you saying, let's let's go to court and ask the court for a declaratory ruling so that whether or not uh, these folks are grandfathered in, whereas we think they are not, we think they waived that when the fence went up. Let's take that to court and let's let the court decide that. And at that time you said, can't do it, you know, you'll just have to bring us back to court or do something. And at that point in time, you just weren't willing. No, Aaron, that's not true. And I have written through that I asked you which one of us was going to prepare the paperwork. Mm -hmm. And you never responded. You didn't give me the courtesy of a reply. No, I talked to you at the courthouse probably about a month ago. It was in May, and you said that sending me a letter, agree to take it to court, obtain a declaratory ruling. And that was May 13 by email. And I wrote back and I said, that's fine, but which one of us is going to prepare the paperwork? And you never responded. Well, I think I did respond regarding uh, that I would prepare it, but uh, I also talked to you down at the courthouse. We were at the courthouse on a different issue, I believe. And, um, um, I brought it up again to you. Right. And, and, and I still at that point the same time, thing. who's going to do this? No, no, no. At that point in time, you said they weren't interested because they they were out of money to pay you, and uh, you know it wasn't going to come to a head unless we did something. So here we are again. And I still believe that whether uh, you know we take this to district court or small claims, that will be one of the issues. Is I think that's a fair statement that it will be a legal issue and I think a lot of the facts of the 30 things that Chief put in his letter deal with that legal question about whether the Raritan's operation is grandfathered or not. And I think part of what we're doing tonight is we're probably laying the groundwork for that action uh, just so that a judge knows exactly what the issues are. Absolutely. Um, and the exact date of enactment of that ordinance I think I had at some point Aaron, but I believe it was 81, maybe you or Scott would know that when the fence ordinance was passed, 80, 1980. Okay, so um, yeah, effective December 17, 1980. Yeah, it's in that, it's in that memo. Anyway. But yeah, and, and that's true. That's that's a very clear legal issue as to what extent can the city pass an ordinance after these folks have been in business for 30 years, and then you're going to say, well, they build a fence. 